Talk Your Potential podcast, where we focus on creating positive, productive, and profitable workplaces. I am your host, Michael Sherlock. I am a leadership and sales expert, best known for being serious about business, despite what you may think by my appearance of often very colorful hair and sometimes crazy shoes. My guests bring a wealth of information that will support your career and your business, along with many pearls of wisdom to support balance in your personal and professional lives. Listen in as I have another amazing conversation with a guest who will certainly shock your potential. It's Elizabeth Letardo, and she is a consultant, a researcher, a co-author of Selling with Noble Purpose, which clearly matches our theme for the month. Um, and, and the rest of that was how to drive revenue and do work that makes you proud, which is clearly about you know not only loving what you do, but loving yourself in the process. As a VP of services at sales leadership consultancy, McLeod and more, Elizabeth leads sales transformation initi- initiatives for clients like Oracle, G Adventures and Pfizer. And just because I like to have people that really have great Great background. She's also a popular LinkedIn learning author, and her work has been featured on the in the Wall Street Journal and on NPR. Those are two places that I hope and inspire to be on one day. So, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to chat and to be part of this series. It's speaking my language already. Oh, I know. I love it. And I think that sometimes people think, I know we're going to get into this, but I know that sometimes people think that leadership has to be like strong and tough and you got to, you know, have these walls around you. And yet if we don't let a little bit of our humanity show through, we can really have some negative consequences. So this is going to be a great series. Absolutely. You know, it's long been said that business should be kept professional and not to get emotional in the workplace, but there's no such thing as a too excited team or a team that's too passionate. And I think when we approach leading with love, we tap into all kinds of superpowers that we know accelerate performance in the workplace. I agree. And I know that's one of your specialties is really making people feel engaged in the workplace. This is great. So I hit just kind of a couple of the highlights on your bio, but tell us a little bit about yourself, your business, and how you help people and companies to shock their potential. So you hit the big points. I'm Elizabeth Letardo. I'm the VP of services at McLeod and Moore and the co-author of the second edition of Selling with Noble Purpose. And the crux of our work can really be found in the subtitle of that book, How to Drive Revenue and Do Work That Makes You Proud. So for the Mm. last several years, I've been working with organizations and sales teams in particular to up the level of purpose that they are experiencing. Because what all of the research has told us from numerous publications like HBR all the way to our firm's research and the basis of selling with noble purpose is that when people feel a high degree of purpose in their work, they outperform their peers because they know Mm. their work makes a difference. So I think Mm -hmm. when it comes to shocking your potential, I would ask everyone, are you feeling that sense of purpose in your work? How can you help yourself get there? And even if it is a shock, we know that when you do get to that sense of purpose, your engagement is really high. You're more receptive to feedback from others. And you ultimately, like I mentioned, outperform whether you're in a sales role or an individual contributor role internally. Absolutely. And as you were talking, I was thinking about this one thing that I I have always said to companies, but I loved it when I first said it to, I was running a sales organization. We had about 500 people um, and I had 30 some managers that reported directly to me. And I remember saying to them in a meeting kind of with their top salespeople and all the managers. And I said, my dream is so that, that you love what you do so much that you cannot wait to get out of bed every morning and get to work. And they're all looking at me like, well, that's great, Michael. <laughs> that's never going to happen. <laughs> and I'm nice. like, wow. Yeah. I'm like, wow, that's your first response is that's never going to happen. Why can't we strive for that? Just because it's not practical doesn't mean it's not you know, possible. And, and how, how do we get that enthusiasm? Because if you have a joy for what you're doing, you will be happier doing it. And therefore, to your point, produce better results than, than your peers without a doubt. Right. And I think that feeling that you described waking up so excited about what you're doing 
feels like such a departure from where so many people are because mm-hmm. work has become even more focused on metrics in the last 10 years. Work has become even more disconnected from our peers and customers in the last 10 years. And that's left this hole in our heart where meaning and fulfillment used to be. But I do think there's an important distinction. I was reading some research the other day around the distinction between passion and purpose. And prior to mm-hmm. reading this, I had sort of lumped the two together and used them interchangeably. But what this research highlighted that I thought was so fascinating fascinating is that purpose, the feeling that your work makes a difference, that it impacts people is more Mm -hmm. of a predictor of your performance than passion is, which is being excited about your work. And what the researcher cited was that passion one waxes and wanes because we know Mm -hmm. that not all jobs are going to be amazingly exciting a hundred percent of the time. And that passion is also individualistic. My passion is not your passion, but we could share a purpose, a commitment to a Mm -hmm. cause larger than both of us. So I think as people are feeling rather dispirited and longing to feel that excitement, we're trying to get excited about our jobs and the task when in actuality, we should be tapping deeper into the impact those tasks have. That's so important. And as you said that, I thought, gosh, I wish I would have made that clarification because in this case, I, we, we, we sold hearing aids. You know, that major, is purpose driven. Yeah. That is purpose driven without a doubt. And yet I had people who might have been passionate about it, but ne- didn't necessarily always see the purpose. They knew it was important. But I remember one day I was talking with one of my top salespeople and I was saying, you know, like, how do you do it? And he, you know, and he was going through kind of his thing. He was really good. He made people feel, feel very comfortable. But I knew there was something missing and I didn't know what it was. And as we were talking, I realized by watching him, because I'd been around people with hearing loss so long, that he had hearing loss, but he wasn't wearing a hearing aid. And so I said to him, do you have hearing loss? And he said, oh yeah, but it's just minor. And I went, how many times do we have this discussion with our patients about well, what do you mean? It's just minor hearing loss. Like, right, you have what to are see you talking the irony about? here. <laughs> I know. And I said, and finally, you know, he's like, I don't understand, Michael, what's the deal? And finally I looked at him and I said, I'm going to tell you something that I probably shouldn't say this way, but I'm going to say it. Shame on you. Shame on you for having hearing loss and not treating it and not telling your patients and being honest about that. Because how can you really know what they're going through? Because you're going through it, but you're trying to, you know, convince them to make that leap. And he looked at me and he goes, I never thought of it that way. And I said, okay, you know, you get hearing aids for free. (laughs) What are you doing? (laughs) Could not work at a better place to solve this problem. And he did. And he, he ended up getting them and he was so much more honest with his, with his um, clients and, and patients from that point on, because he then said, Hey, look, I've been in your shoes. In fact, I'm kind of a hypocrite, you know, I, I've been selling these and knowing it's important for you, but not realizing for me. And that was such a, that was an eye-opening experience for me for us really being connected, any of us with what we do, with what the purpose is. Right. And when we think about leading with love, I think what I love in that story is that the level of vulnerability really enabled everyone, both him and future patients for years down the road to have a better experience. And when we talk about leading with love, vulnerability is of course a crucial part in that. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about that. You know, so this is the theme that I'm putting out there. It's, this has been really fun for me to transition the podcast a little bit and, you know, really start having a theme for the month and saying, I know each of my guests have incredible stories and they, things that they want to promote and talk about their books, which are all, they're all important. And I love sharing them, but I love having a common theme that pulls us together because I think then we really start looking at bigger concepts. So, you know, what are your top tips or what are your thoughts for people that are listening to really lead with love and use that as part of their noble purpose? That's a great question. I think to lead with love often can sound flowery. And we hear a lot about love in the workplace. Now research has identified that these human emotions like love and vulnerability and pride actually contribute to the bottom line results that we're producing as people. 
But I think the challenge for leaders is to make a concept like leading with love, be very specific and really action oriented in the flow of work. And what Mm -hmm. I would suggest, of course, I'm on a, a purpose bent, having just written Selling with Noble Purpose. What I would suggest is that a way to make others feel love and to even bring love out in yourself is to identify the impact you are having on other people. Because we Mm -hmm. know that humans are at their best when others are depending on them. We are a Mm -hmm. social species. We literally cannot survive by ourselves as Mm -hmm. much as we would like to forget that in the workplace. So (laughs) as a leader, the more you can connect what your team is doing to the impact it has on others, the more you can bring out that positive ripple effect in people of your action does this, then this, then this, then this, and just keeps getting bigger, the more likely they are to feel love for their work, love for their role, and ultimately more fulfilled in whatever they're doing. So I think the challenge again is, is to take that lead with love and make it actually real in the cadence of daily business. I love that. Um, and I think that's really important as we move into a world of work that is going to become more remote. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I think we, we're all realistic that, you know, no matter what is happening, we're finding that people can be effective from home. You know, do we need all these giant office buildings? So there's cost savings to that, but there's a, a, a personal interaction cost to that that sometimes might get in the way of people realizing what their picture, you know, their part in that big picture is. I mean, it's easy when you're in a big office to see, okay, if I'm sitting here and I'm having this meeting and somebody can come by, I feel important. But Mm -hmm. I think now more than ever recognizing like the notes I put were, you know, understanding the impact on other people and, and in the larger organization, we need to take more time to reflect on that. Absolutely. You know, you're speaking my language on this, this concern around transitioning from working from home. And when this first started to occur, I was thinking to myself, it sounds like based on the headlines, these decisions are being made from a logistical level. We're looking at the dollars and the cost savings we could accrue from working from home. We're Mm -hmm. looking at the IT structures and what needs to change to enable that. But no one is addressing this human element of it, that all of these beings we're sending home with their laptops are people with feelings and there are people who are going to react differently. And over the long term, what does that look like? And after several months, I think we started to see that organizational cultures who weren't as strong as they thought they were start to deteriorate because people yes, lost yes. those connections when they weren't coincidental. Yeah. Well, and, and I had someone um, share with me recently that he said, you know, one of the biggest challenges I face now is that I don't work well alone. Mm-hmm. And there's a couple of reasons, you know, for him. He, number one is that he gets isolated. So he literally lives alone. And so then, and he's a very social being and then he works alone you know, you're still working with people. And I put that in the little air quotes because, you know, you're still collaborating with people or you may have a Zoom meeting, but that loss of the stopping by the desk to, to visit, the grabbing the, you know, a cup of coffee together, you know, those social interactions are just as important. And you're right, we're missing them. And I think leading with love as leaders of people, it has to be recognizing that, you know, what everybody's personality is different one way when you're all in the office. It's different when you take everybody out for, you know, dinner and happy hour or whatever, but it's also different when they're sitting from home and recognizing that those differences are going to have an impact, not only on your bottom line and top line, but to the morale and the sense of, of belonging to your team. It's, it's, it really takes leadership to a whole different level, I think. Absolutely. And the emphasis on creating a feeling of togetherness could not Mm -hmm. be more important. I think, you know, I mentioned we're all social creatures and as much as we'd Mm -hmm. like to forget that, it's the truth. When people are working remotely, we double down on our own metrics, on our own tasks, on our own initiatives. And it's easier to lose context of how those initiatives fit, who they impact, just because we're not in the center of that impact every day. So I think as leaders transition their teams to work from home and start to build work from home cultures, as so many organizations have committed to doing in the long term, pointing everyone towards that shared vision, the collective impact is going to become even more important. Otherwise, we're just, you know, thousands of people with our own metrics that email each other sometimes, and that's not going to pan out well. 
Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it's, you know, with communication is so vital, you know, to achieve success anyway. And we, re, we have to redefine what communication is, you mm -hmm. know, in this new working environment so that it's not just emailing or it's not just checking off. Like we use a sauna in my company for, you know, task completion, which I love, but it still doesn't give you a sense of collaboration. Mm -hmm. It gives you a sense of checking things off boxes. And I've been thinking about that lately. Like, how do I continue to get my team who's all remote? My whole team's out of Kenya. How do I get them to feel connected to each other, regardless of where they live, connected to me, given timelines, but understanding that each of their jobs impacts the other and really embrace that. And it's a whole different kind of, of, of leading situation that better start with some personal attention or else it just becomes task, task, task. Absolutely. I think it would be fascinating to look at how many different onboarding experiences have come out of this remote work and how many have done an exceptional job at bringing someone into a company culture that was strong at connecting their role to the larger impact at building their, their position in their team. And how many have felt like here are your logging credentials. I think we sent you a water bottle. You're on this team now. <laughs> I, I think the spectrum of amazing to terrible would be even huger than in-person onboarding. It's a great dialogue to think about where we revert when it's stressful and because we get things done and then there's a, a solution to it, but it's not developing the organization. It's not developing the people further. And so we've, I think we're going to see these gaps between onboarding, like you say, and even just uh, employee development over time. I mean, we I see it right now with our one. kids. Yeah with kids getting behind in school because of, you know, trying to, to learn from home, I think we're going to see the same kind of thing with people's professional careers. I certainly agree. I, I think, unfortunately, many organizations have taken what I would say is a, a penny wise pound foolish approach to mm -hmm. transitioning to work from home. Penny wise mm -hmm. being we're getting everything done. We are saving money. We are checking all the boxes. Pound foolish being we are losing the collaborative spirit the togetherness, the purpose-driven culture that may have enabled us to create competitive differentiation or a huge project breakthrough in the future. Not to say that we can't do that from home, right. but it will take another level of intention. Yeah, it does. It takes more effort, more focused effort. And I really do agree with you that, that getting people to understand and embrace the purpose of what they're doing um, should breathe new life into them. It should give them like, you know, as an individual, more excitement. I, I have this actually going on right now. It's kind of interesting with my director of marketing. Cause she's, she's been doing all these things in the background with the other team. And she's like trying to get them to understand why, you know, liking and commenting on one of our posts for the day is so important. And what does it mean to actually, you know, show that you're a part of a company on LinkedIn. And, and, you know, as we get the, to this higher level, it's really fun to watch my team say, Oh, my little part in this is not a little part. My mm -hmm. part is really important to the whole and how do we continue to have a message? And I think the more to your point that you can help people embrace with that, um, they will be more committed to their organizations. And that's important now too. Absolutely. And I, I think get people to embrace that can be approached from one of two ways. You can tell them, which of course is better than not doing anything at all and leaving this empty void in their hearts, or we can ask questions. And we know that when we ask questions, people connect to the information on a much deeper level. So asking mm -hmm. questions as a leader, if you're listening to this of your team, why does our work matter? Who does our work impact? If we fell off the face of the planet, what would happen? Who would suffer mm -hmm. from that? And getting your team to articulate those answers is going to be much more effective than the long run because they can't argue with themselves or at least they right. won't in front of you. <laughs> and if they don't have answers, then that's important for us as leaders to recognize too, that, that we do have a gap there and we have to figure out how to bridge that gap. And better to identify that now through what you would like to be a collaborative conversation than have that gap show up in an exit interview. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Gosh, I love, I just love your, your, um, your concept overall without a doubt. And we'll definitely have links to your book um, in the show notes. And uh, as we, you know, get kind of near the end, what I always like to make sure is we'll have all of your contact information in the show notes, but I find that sometimes people want to type it in right now while they're listening. So if they want to find you, what's the best way for them to find you? 
You can add me on LinkedIn at Elizabeth Lotardo. You can also, if you're interested in learning more about the new edition of Selling with Noble Purpose, visit sellingwithnoblepurpose.com. Excellent. Well, before we go, do you have any last words of wisdom or pearls of advice for my listeners and viewers? I think as we walk into leading with love and the spirit of love, it's easy to feel that work is uh, disconnected from that. But I would say that the leaders who put love at the center, the individual contributors who connect what they're doing to a positive impact it has on others and who operate from this very heart focused way are the people who not only from the research outperform their job or outperform their competitors, they're the people who experience their job a lot better. So if the performance mm-hmm. incentive isn't enough for you as a leader or as an individual contributor to bring this love-centered philosophy to your organization, to your role, know that your personal happiness is also going to be up-leveled from this philosophy. I love it. And it's so true because we know that not everybody is money motivated. Mm-hmm. Um, and regardless of they're money motivated or not, having a sense of really believing in what the company mission is, what you're, what you're contributing, that you do make a difference will enhance your own satisfaction, no matter what. Absolutely. I'll close with the last line of selling with noble purpose, which is don't let anyone tell you, you have to choose between making money and making a difference. Purpose and profit are connected. You can have both. You deserve both. We all do. Excellent. Thank you, Elizabeth, so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us on another episode of the Shock Your Potential podcast. And as always, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and like us today.